recording now. We'll start the call at um, six o'clock. So I'll see you then. Good evening, dear friends. Um, Noelia, I wasn't recording when you said that. So That's do you fine. want to say it one more time and everybody joins the call? She, Noelia was just saying, I just started the recording for everybody on YouTube watching the replay. Um, and I guess even by the time this YouTube is up, well, we still have, would have another week. So if you'd like to say one more time, the recording. Sure. Um, I'm going to do that. So we're going to have a big event. It's going to be on the 26th of June. It's a fundraising event. We're going to be planting trees. Um, it's going to be a Fort Lauderdale. You can check everything by going to healtheplanet.com and under calendar. You're going to see there our event and I hope you can join us. All right, everybody. So it is 6.02. Thank you, Noelia, for sharing that. Um, and as I mentioned, we are recording the call. We've been recording our YouTube videos or our Zoom calls now to upload to YouTube. So that way, if you're not able to tune in during the class, you can tune in at a later time. But I'm grateful for you all being here this evening. Um, I would love to hear in the chat where you're zooming in from while we wait for everybody else to join us. Um, please make sure that you're on mute. Everybody is muted. Not that we don't want to hear you, but as we know, Zoom calls can get pretty crazy when everybody's talking. So you can communicate with one another through the chat option. And I would love if you just said where you're zooming in from. I see Jeff. Zooming in, we love to see it. I know Richie's zooming in, uh, but I don't know Millie or KP or Wendy or Kim or the Monstera Leaf, Amanda the Monstera Leaf. <laughs> if you'd like to write in the chat where you're zooming in from and what you'd like to learn this evening as well too. We're gonna be diving into our final um, piece of our food forest series that we're, we've been doing this March, and not this March, this spring. We started in March uh, and it is now June. And so we've been going over what, food, what a food forest is. We started in our first class with design. So how do we design a food forest? All of these are on YouTube if you, this is your first time joining us. Uh, the second one was how do we actually create it? So we've designed it, um, we've learned what to do, but now we are tangibly creating it on the ground. So what steps do we take to do that? And this evening, we're gonna talk about garden care, holistic garden care. So um, we've created our food forest and now rainy season has begun as it has this last week and weeds are growing and iguanas are emerging from their winter slumber and pests are emerging. So what do we do when this happens and we have our system in place? How do we not freak out and how do we take care of the system in a way that um, takes care of the system as a whole and doesn't cause harm through our actions? I see you all writing in from the chat. Ontario, Kim, wow. Um, you can also write in the chat as well too, while we still have Noelia on the call. It's always useful to know how you guys found out about our events too. It's so wonderful now that we're able to reach a larger audience. The East Coast of Australia near Sydney, Amanda the Monstera Leaf, wow. Uh, Florida, Fort Lauderdale. And yes, Noelia wrote in the chat the link for the tree planting. So if you're local, you're welcome to come. Uh, participate, plant a tree. It was for World Environment Day, which was earlier this month. Um, and we're gonna be planting a lot of great trees in our local food forest gardens. So without further ado, I say we get started. So uh, before I share my screen, I should introduce myself. My name is Megan. I'm Heal the Planet's Whole Systems Educator, and I am really grateful to be with you all tonight. Um, I grew up here in South Florida. Heal the Planet is located in South Florida, and I didn't have much awareness of the living world growing up. Very little, in fact, I would say. Just going through all the motions in a busy city like most of us. And um, I share this all to let you know that if 
I can teach a Zoom workshop on holistic garden care, so can you. <laughs> um, all of this is information that I've learned through the years, specifically through learning about permaculture. So we'll talk more about permaculture in our PowerPoint when we get started. We'll kind of review what a food forest is. And for me, food forest growing is my favorite way of growing. A lot of times when we think of growing food, we think of straight lines, we think of traditional agriculture, uh, we think of boxes, we think of things contained and controlled, but the food forest is definitely without a doubt the best way we can grow food in the tropics for sure. And one of the most efficient ways we can grow food in the urban environment as well too. Just earlier today, I was watching a YouTube video with Jeff Lawton on urban food forest gardens and he, was saying some really wonderful things about uh, what food forests can bring and permaculture design to the urban environment. So if you're in the urban environment, all of this is possible in a small space. I'm looking right outside my door at my front yard food forest, which at last count has about 180 edible medicinal plants in just a very small space that I don't really even take care of very much other than just enjoying it. We'll talk more about that and um, that's really what we're going to be focusing on today is garden care. So they often say the cobbler's son goes shoeless sort of thing where um, I'm taking care of a lot of other gardens. So I don't spend too much time actually taking care of mine, but the garden takes care of itself when we design well. So if this is your first class and you want to learn more about design, you can look back to our previous design class. But today, our gardens are already in place and now we are taking steps to take care of our garden. So let's dive in. I'm gonna share my screen now. <sighs> How's everybody doing tonight? If you're in Florida, it's been rainy for several days now, but we have been needing it. Okay, so can you guys see my screen? I see you, Jeff. Jeff, you're my man on, on the ground. He can see it. Okay, great. Thumbs up from Jeff. All right, so caring for a food forest. This could also just be caring for a garden in general. Um, let's dive in. The beautiful flower we see on the left is a cranberry hibiscus. And it's so funny that this is in the beginning of this slideshow because just today, I was in the outdoor shower and cranberry hibiscus is a fall plant here. Um, the flowers that you see on the left, they only bloom for one day. So it opens up for one day and then closes up and goes to seed. And today I was noticing, as I mentioned, we've been having this rain. I was like, what is that green thing coming out of the seed pod? And since the rains have started actually on the stem of the plant where the seed is in the seed pod, it's trying to sprout out from the seed pod. That's funny that that should be there. And on the right is a mango tree. We are in mango season right now. This was a gigantic mango I saw when I worked on the big island. It's been a great year for mangoes for my local friends. Um, if you're not mangoed out right now, I was turning down eating mangoes yesterday and that's pretty rare. Um, okay, so we're just gonna review real quick what is a food forest garden. So a food forest garden is growing food in the way that a forest grows. You froze up, Megan. Yes, Megan. I think you got disconnected. All right. Technical issues. <laughs> well, I'm happy to see we have people from so many places that are not necessarily in Florida or Fort Lauderdale, but even other countries. So we're very happy to have you. Thank you.
Well, while we wait for Megan to come back, for those that have never been in our website, healtheplanet.com, we are a nonprofit organization. And what we do is we educate kids and adults about the power of choice and how we can make choices that help us have a more sustainable planet. We teach about nutrition and wellness. There she is. We can't hear you. What a dramatic turn of events. That's never happened before. It literally just was like, you're off. So we're back. Hopefully that doesn't happen again. Uh, thanks, Noelia, for covering whatever happened in that time where I was in the void. Um, I don't know if you guys follow astrology at all, but that is some big Mercury retrograde things that would happen. Just the internet cutting out. We've never had that happen before. Okay, so let me share my screen again. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Did I do that for myself? Um, let me see. Bear with me, you guys. How about while we're in this uh, purgatory that we're in, you guys can write in the chat something that you'd like to learn, like maybe a troubleshooting question from your garden. So like something that you're cha uh, feeling challenged with right now that you would like to um, work through. Um, Noelia, for some reason it's saying host disabled participant screen sharing, except for we're the host. So I don't know what that is. If you want, could you go on the back end on our Zoom account while, and I'll just keep, keep the yeah, class. Let me, let me log out. Okay. So we'll see if Noelia can figure that out. If not, we don't have to have this presentation. I can just be a talking head here. Um, but the PowerPoint is always nice to have too. I'm very challenged right now with an invasion of pavement ants eating all of the garden. Interesting. Frost, but don't think you can fix that, Kim. That's a good one. I uh, like to learn how to control invasion of pavement destroying ants. So Millie, I can't remember where you were calling in from, but... Um, we will definitely cover those questions. Ants, ants can be a challenging one. Ants inside the home are also never fun too. Uh, Fort Lauderdale. Oh yeah, Millie, I think you were on the previous call, weren't you? My yard is covered with them. So I've never heard of pavement ants before, um, but something that we can do to help with ants is to, they eat everything. Everything, exclamation point. <laughs> So something I know that it helps with ants is <laughs> um, moisture levels in the soil sometimes when there's, but we've been in the dry season. So that's an interesting mystery. Um, I've also heard of people using cinnamon to help deter ants as well too. Um, but perhaps it could be a matter of fertility in the garden as well too. A lot of times when we have these invasive pests and creatures and weeds that move into our sites that are so um, running rampant, it can be because we don't have a healthy ecosystem in place, which is totally natural. Here in the urban environment, we have very depleted soils. So I would love to hear more about what it is that you're doing to build healthy soil. We're gonna talk more about that in our class. Um, and also, since you're local as well too, maybe I could do, okay, screen sharing is enabled again. Do a little research on pavement ants. And if anyone in the chat has ever dealt with pavement ants as well too, um, feel free to chime in. All right, uh, I see Richie has a thumbs up on his screen. Is the thumbs up, can you see, this, can you see the screen sharing? Yeah, just yes, can see, thank you. Okay, thank you, Noelia, you're the best. Okay, so back to what a food forest is. Food forest is growing food in the way that a forest grows. So we're using all these different layers to maximize space through stacking and also to create greater food security as well too. Um, so say we have something move in and uh, put certain things, put, put challenge on the system. 
um, knock out a certain crop, we have all these different layers and levels of fertility that ensure greater health of the system as a whole. Um, so I think when I got cut off, I was saying we're designing from pattern to detail. So that overarching layer is our canopy. That's our overarching pattern. And then we're moving down to the details, which would be um, our soil surface <laughs> and um, all those things that make up the understory beneath our trees, even moving into climbers, climbing the trees. But first and foremost, when we're designing, we want to look towards our overarching pattern our canopy plants. So how a forest grows is through succession. So just keeping this in mind as we're designing our food forest system. Um, so we're designing from those pioneer plants that start to move in, which is like that weed popping up through the sidewalks cr crack, creating a little bit of shade, dropping some leaves, starting to build some fertility all the way up to a forest system. That's how a forest can get started. So a lot of times it can feel overwhelming for how do we actually begin doing these things but it can be as simple as a weed growing truly in a sidewalk crack and moving up from there. Um, these are just some elements that make up a food forest system. But we wanna keep in mind so that we have a healthy, strong system. Uh, a food forest is mainly made up of perennial plants. Oftentimes we're stacking functions as well. Um, so that way we have a lot of uses from one plant. We talked about nitrogen fixing plants in the past and we'll talk more about the that as well too, our support species. Um, Self-renewing soils, so Millie, um, focusing on how can we build healthy soil in our system as well too with fungi and bacteria, well-developed soil life, plant communities and healthy guilds and a stable diverse ecosystem with beneficial connections. That's how we can ensure greater security and um, greater ease in our food forests as well too. So why food forest? Just a quick word on why we dive in. If you already have your food forest in place, I don't have to sell you on it. Um, but it's nice to have access to food and medicine right outside our back door. Um, it's a long-term food sol solution with little upkeep. It requires very little energy to take care of as well too. As I mentioned, I'm not spending a lot of time working on my garden and instead I'm just constantly receiving from the garden. Um, we're maximizing space. I really do not have a lot of space in the urban environment. So how can we use that space as efficiently as possible? Wildlife habitat, seen more zebra longwing butterflies this last month than ever. Um, being able to connect with the living world right outside our back door, no matter how busy of a city we live in, is a gift. And we just have greater resilience and learn about regeneration and how we can take care of our planet and take care of each other and ourselves. So these are the permaculture principles. I mentioned the word permaculture before, um, but primarily that is what we're gonna be focusing on a lot of these permaculture principles tonight. Take care of our food forest system. And I would say the most important of all in caring for food forest garden is that first principle all the way over there on the far left observe and interact. So while I don't spend a lot of time actually laboring in my garden, I have some work days. Uh, for the most part, I'm just observing and interacting with my garden. So every time I am right above my computer screen, I'm looking out at my food forest garden. Every morning when I wake up, I like to first thing walk outside and just see what's going on. Um, just looking out the window and noticing what's going on, taking a little walk through your garden at day's end helps us to have a better idea of what's going on. Like today, how I mentioned, I saw those cranberry hibiscus seeds popping out of their uh, little seed pot that they were in trying to grow. Would I have noticed that if I had not been outside observing, interacting? No, I wouldn't have. So when we become intimate with our system, we're better able to take care of it. An example of this that I can think of this last week is to my left outside of this window right here is my summer garden bed. And now as the rainy season picks up in our place, 
there is such an immense amount, amount of life and pest pressure uh, and thrive at this intensely tropical time where it's raining. It feels like an entirely different world outside the last week. It feels like we're living in a human steam room where it's just like growth, immense growth. And as soon as the sun comes out, everything is just growing and everything wants to live. So with that want to move through and bugs and uh, caterpillars and moths laying their eggs onto things. And so I was looking at my seminal pumpkin and my amaranth outside the door. And I noticed, observed and interacted that some, there was little holes in the leaves and I saw some cabbage loopers there on the seminal pumpkin. And I saw another mystery caterpillar on the red amaranth. So just noticing those little changes, even just in a day or two, so much of the leaves were eaten, helps us stay on top of things. Do your understanding of what's going on. All right, let's keep moving. So not gonna go into design, but most of all, what I hope you all take away from this class is this pattern that we talk more about in our design class, but primarily if we're creating a food forest garden, we want to use this mother pattern to, um, it's also called the general model as well in permaculture, to design and have a healthy, strong system. How a forest, not just a food forest, but a regular forest is strong is because those nutrients are constantly cycling back into the system. So those leaves from the mother tree drop down and feed, continue to feed the tree itself and also those seedlings that pop up from the ground as well too. And so we've gotten in this um, way of being in that we are like this morning, I was listening to nature sounds. Every Thursday I turn on in the morning some sort of nature sounds or something in my house because every Thursday morning my neighbors have the lawn crew come through and it's very loud, the leaf blower and the weed whacker and all the energy that it takes to maintain these lawn systems that we have created are not just noisy and loud, but also really energy intensive. They take a lot of input. And so when we allow the leaf to just fall and stay where it is, we're creating healthier soil and we're creating a healthier and stronger system and we're also alleviating a lot of work uh, for ourselves too. Of course, we can design and say we want to rake up those leaves and put them around on the base of the tree in a more aesthetically pleasing way. Um, but getting rid of it out of the system is going to do us a disservice and make us less strong as growers. drop banana leaves down. This is a tropical or you can chop and circle is great. We have a video of this on our Feel the Planet YouTube page. We did a whole series on composting. Um, but banana circles are great because they hide that waste as we see it, those leaves that have dropped that we don't necessarily want to have around. So in the center of the banana circle, that would be where we would put our compost, our dead leaves, all that stuff that feeds the bananas. Um, so yeah, just an example of how we could do it aesthetically pleasing. So what makes a stable food forest system? Important to know while we're caring for our food forest garden. Uh, rich soil life and biodiversity. A correct mix, I don't really know what correct would be, but a healthy mix of bacteria and fungi, definitely. A balance of canopy coverage, a balance of plant life and diversity, sufficient nutrients available to the system and correct plants for our specific zone. So for my local friends, our zone is 10B. Jeff, I see you in the little corner of my screen right now. We were just talking about this in our permaculture class earlier this week. <laughs> he's putting up the 11. Um, 
yet we're really pushing zones now with our changing climate, with things rapidly changing all the time um, in our place. I would say that we are definitely moving more towards zone 11, which is interesting because we're able to grow more tropical plants, um, but also challenging in some ways because things are changing. So I would love to hear, uh, uh, I don't know where your zone is as well too, if you're confused about what I'm saying, you can just look up your place. So my friend who is from Ontario, you could look up your place in Ontario, hardiness zone. Uh, and that gives you a good idea of what plants will grow in your place. So that way you could look up zone 10B permaculture plants for the understory or zone 10B support species plants or fruit trees for zone 10B or whatever your zone is. They get smaller the higher up. I'd imagine you're a pretty number up there in Ontario. Oh, pushing ahead. Okay, so the reason we're talking about soil here is because I was talking to my friend John from the Urban Farming Institute today, and I always remember him saying that when people would come to the farm, he would say, you know, we don't feed the plants here. And then he would pause for a second and he would say, we feed the soil. So a lot of times when we think of gardening, we think of plant food, like how do I feed my plant? And the way that we feed our plant is through the soil. The soil is our foundation. The soil is the foundation of all life on earth, but especially in our garden. So if we have healthy soil, that is the greatest security we can have for a healthy and strong food forest system that requires very little care and input because that rich microbial life is keeping things in balance. Um, plants are just like us. So why is it that sometimes we can fly on an airplane and we'll be totally okay, and then other times we fly on an airplane and we catch a cold, we get sick? Oftentimes it's because we had maybe a stressful week before. Um, maybe we encountered something that weakened our immune system. So think about plants in that way too. A lot of times when plants become susceptible to disease, disease or pests or systems as a whole, thinking of those um, pavement ants, I think was what they were called that Millie said, why do those things move into the system? It's oftentimes because we had some sort of weakness to begin with. So the way we can build a strong and healthy system is through healthy, strong soil. So we have a whole workshop online on soil building, but I'll cover just a few um, points of how we can build healthy, strong soil. So this is just essentially what soil is. Um, it's that top soil layer for my friends in the tropics. The top soil is breaking down rapidly, especially during the summer and rainy season, um, which is why it's even more important for us to keep our biomass and our leaves on the ground. Uh, but in temperate climates, you all have that resting period of winter where the top soil is able to build up. Um, but yeah, so on top, our organic layer at the top is our organic matter, like our leaves, then those things break down and build soil. And then we have our bedrock. So right outside my door right now, I have a piece of limestone that I got from the Kampong down in Miami yesterday. I found it. Um, but I would be interested to hear as well in the chat what your bedrock is in your place. It's important that we know our bedrock because then we can understand our soil structure. Um, so because we have a limestone bedrock here in our place, we have very sandy soil in our place that's also very porous. Lots of things can run through it very quickly. And keeping that in mind, I mentioned I was talking to my friend John earlier, we were talking about how everything is interconnected. Um, we we're talking about how can we connect our thinking of our oceans to our soil, or to our gardens. And so the decisions we make in our gardens feeds back into our waterways. Even if you're not on the ocean, um, it's feeding back into the rivers near where you are because everything is going into that soil system, going into the bedrock and feeding back into our waterways. So I say this to help you um, Keep in mind that when we experience challenges in the garden, 
not to go to the big box store and feel like you have to reach for um, some sort of fertilizer herbicide, something to make the system grow immensely or kill something. We'll talk about what we can do in those situations. But most of all, before we do any sort of action like that, we're trying to build healthy, strong soil. So like I said, we have that whole PowerPoint on soil on Heal the Planet's page, but we'll go over a couple soil allies and uh, right now. Let me see what I got in my notes. It's a pretty psychedelic looking slide. Um, so what we got on the left is some sort of fungi or bacteria, mushrooms, and then looks like some broken down soil with maybe some worms in it. I can't really see because I'm covered right now. Um, but essentially what we want to focus on when we're thinking of the soil is um, fungi, bacteria, and also whatever critters are living in the soil in your place. So have you noticed my friends in Florida lately? Uh, there's been more millipedes around. Just this morning, I went outside and I was like, whoa, there's about a thousand million millipedes outside, all mating with one another, all reproducing, all just wallowing and loving this uh, wetness that we've been having. Soil critters, when we get rain, they emerge from the soil um, and we see them more because obviously the water is going down into the soil which makes them come to the top because they're like, whoa, it's wet in here. I need to, need to get out of here because all those tunnels that they have created have filled with water. And so our soil allies are things that we want to focus on when we're building soil because they help make it easier. So I think my next slide, I have a whole slide on millipedes right here because I really feel that millipedes are important. Other places, do you guys have millipedes? You might have centipedes. Uh, but millipedes don't have stingers, so they don't sting us. They're just these kind of goofy little creatures that move around. They get lost inside our houses here. You probably see those little spiral roly polies, as they're called around here inside of your home. And you're like, how did you get in here? Uh, sometimes they'll come in through the air vent. Uh, sometimes they'll wander in through cracks, but essentially they're lost and they need to make it back to the soil. Otherwise, they'll dry out. So if you do find a millipede inside your house, which I'm sure we all are finding at this time, especially, you can just toss it back outside. And here's all the cool things that millipedes do. I saw this actually on a Miami compost page the other day. So I was like, I should source them because millipedes are the best. And they're one of our definite, definite soil uh, allies here in our place. We also have worms, obviously earthworms. We'll talk more about that. But millipedes have a hard exoskeleton. So they're different from worms. Uh, they're natural decomposers and local soil all-stars. I added that in. <laughs> that excel, I also added that in at breaking down organic matter. Uh, they create tunnels for microorganisms to move through the soil. So as we said, the tunnels are flooded right now. So that's why they're out uh, making millipede love in the streets right now. They produce fecal matter that is diverse in bioavailable nutrients. So they're breaking things down, they're pooping it out and they're creating healthy soil structure. They have the ability to consume organic waste five times their body weight per day, pretty cool. And they provide microorganisms diversity. They, pro they provide microorganism diversity through their gut which facilitates nutrient cycling and creates ideal soil structures. So way to go millipedes, you guys are the best. Thank you so much for being around. And if you see them in your house, throw them outside because they're lost. Uh, I think the next one's vermicompost. While we're talking about critters, let's talk about vermicompost. So vermicompost is composting with worms. Like I said, we have a whole soil building series on um, Heal the Planet's YouTube page where you get to see my worm bin, which is right there on the right. Um, and learn more about how to vermicompost. But essentially, compost and vermicompost is a probiotic for the soil. So is millipede poop. We should have a cool name for millipede composting too, like vermicomposting. But what this is, is it's adding bacteria to the soil. So this is important because bacteria is so foundational to life, our lives, and to life on our planet. I often think of a kid who I had in one of my 
classes before a gardening class and I was talking about bacteria in the soil and he just gasped and was like, am I gonna get sick from touching the soil? And we have this backwards mentality around bacteria. Bacteria is actually really important. I'm sure probably you being on a workshop tonight around garden care, you've probably heard about the microbiome and things like that. Maybe you've taken a probiotic for your gut. Maybe you've eaten fermented foods. Um, but when we have a healthy gut filled with strong bacteria, it's able to break things down efficiently and we're able to handle whatever we encounter in the world for the most part. Um, and so the same goes for our soil. And so worm poop, vermicompost, black gold, as it's known, creates healthy bacteria in the soil, which is really, really important. So vermicompost does that and so does compost. So I would love to hear in the chat if you are already composting. Um, if you'd like to learn more about composting, we have that whole composting series. I definitely recommend starting composting today. It's a very simple way to start coming into relationship with the living world and also building healthy soil in your system to create a healthy, strong millipost. <laughs> I was like, yes. I thought somebody was maybe talking about composting in the chat, but millipost is a great word. Um, but yes, compost today is all I got to say about that. You'll have healthy soil, you'll have a stronger system, and you will keep waste out of the landfill too. So if you want to learn more about composting, feel free to check out our composting series. Can't recommend it enough. Noelia thought of a catchy name for it. What is it called? Let the composting begin. So look up Heal the Planet, Let the Composting Begin, and you will find it there. Okay, so keeping with our soil theme, so you have this probiotic, this good bacteria in our soil, but how do we get those nutrients that are lacking in our soil as well? Um, the way we can do this is through dynamic accumulators and support species. So we talked more about this in our previous uh, classes, but dynamic accumulators are plant all-stars that provide living plant food. So they're essentially like living fertilizer in our garden. Um, the one you see on the left right here is comfrey, and the one you see with the beautiful yellow flowers on the right is Mexican sunflower or Tithonia diversifolia. So if you want to learn dynamic accumulators and support species for your place, just simply figure out your hardiness zone, 10B for me. So I would look up 10B permaculture food forest support species. So the yellow sunflower you see right there provides phosphorus to the system. So think about it, if we ate the same thing every day, we wouldn't feel very strong and very healthy. So how can we provide that diversity to our plants? How can we help our plants have a nice, strong, diverse diet without having to go buy fertilizer from the um, big box store? And the answer is through these support species. So most fertilizer that we get at the store is a combination of NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So this yellow sunflower you see pulls phosphorus up from the soil and is able to um, hold it in its leaves. And then we chop and drop those leaves and put them onto our plants to feed those plants, give them a dose of phosphorus. I had a lady in our permaculture design certification the other day, she was talking about, what about banana peels? I keep seeing videos online about banana, banana peels in the garden and banana peels can provide, we have bananas in this picture right here. Bananas can provide potassium like they do for us. Um, and then there's these nitrogen fixing plants too. Is that our next slide? No, that's a bone. <laughs> uh, nitrogen fixing plants are plants that take nitrogen from the air. Nitrogen is one of the number one things missing in most soil. If you see a sad depleted plant, a lot of times they are missing nitrogen. What we're pouring on, on, onto all of our agricultural fields is a synthetic blend of this fertilizer primarily made up of nitrogen. And nitrogen is something that certain plants can fix. So you could look up nitrogen fixers for your place and some of my favorite nitrogen fixers are pigeon pea, ice cream bean, um, 
And then we have ground covers as well too, like sunshine, mimosa, and perennial peanut. But we won't go too into the details of specific plants because I know you guys are calling in from all different places. But nitrogen fixing plants essentially carry out plant magic where they are able to take this molecule that is not bioavailable to the soil otherwise, store it in their root nodes because of the symbiotic relationship with a bacteria called rhizobium. They store it in their root nodes and then they slowly release it to the plants around them. And also they store it in their leaves as well too. So when we chop those plants back, because a lot of times they're pretty fast growing, we can feed it to our other plants too, put it around the base of the tree, cover it with mulch, and you get a perfect plant food for your fruit trees or whatever it is that you've got that needs a little bit of support. Um, if anybody has any questions on this too, feel free to save them towards the end. We'll do a little question and answer, um, but let's keep going. So remineralization is just um, what all soil is made up of, dead stuff. Um, so, you know, my neighbor, he shoots iguanas and puts them in a trash can. And it's like, we could just bury the iguana too, you know, because the iguanas have bones. Fish bones are great too. Jeff, I see you on the call. Do you ever bury fish bones in your garden? He's a fisherman, thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's a great way to add nutrients to our system. Whatever it is that you got, we don't want to go around killing stuff, but like if you got something dead, uh, that provides a nice calcium for the soil. And everyone's favorite subject, humanure, urine, and charged biochar. Um, so yeah, what about those plants that don't provide that? What about those minerals outside of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium? We can get iron from nails and things like that. Um, calcium from shells, but if we think about it, we all have pretty amazing diverse diets now because we are living in the, um, the industrial world where we can just go to the store and buy whatever we want. I assume most of you probably have a pretty good diet as well too. If you're taking any antibiotics, we want to avoid um, peeing in the garden and things like that. But urine is a really easy way to feed our system. Peeing next to a tree can really go a long way. A lot of our fruiting, flowering plants really, really appreciate urine. If you feel funny about it too, you don't want to pee outside, you could pee in a bucket in your bathroom and then put it in a, a, a watering can, water it down, water your plants with that. But it is amazing the growth that you will see when you simply add our waste products. That's another thing we've gotten very confused about is that what comes out of our bodies is not waste. It's not meant to be put into fresh water and um, all of it, all the crazy stuff that we do around it, wiping ourselves with trees, things like that. But that is a conversation for another day. And we just met for the first time on this chat too. So if you wanna learn more about urine and humanure, definitely look into it. It's a really easy, free way to feed our systems. Humanoid is a little more challenging in the urban environment, but um, I think somebody might have unmuted themselves. If you did, please mute yourself again. Let me check it out. Oh, got it. It was our dear friend, Wendy. No worries, honestly, I don't want you guys to feel like you can't speak, but as we know, it gets kind of chaotic. How's everybody doing? Anybody have any questions? I can hear, give me one second. That's my dinner for after the call. And I was like, I gotta turn that off. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. So we're blazing past soil now. So we have healthy soil in our system. Now, what do we do? We have this pest moving in and we don't know what to do. So you're saying, whoa, a monarch butterfly, that is not a pest. Who I am today is because of these creatures. Uh, one of, I bought a milkweed plant several years ago and that really initiated me into the world of living things. But if we think about it, this monarch butterfly flies along, she lays her eggs on the milkweed, they completely decimate the milkweed, they eat it all the way back to the stick. But the reason we plant this stuff is for them. So if we think about it, what really is a pest in the grand scheme of things? Everything is just trying to live. 
And in our urban environment where there's so few plants and living things at this time, um, isn't it kind of a blessing that they're able to come and find their host plant and lay their eggs on it? Sometimes, but sometimes like with the seminal pumpkin, you're like cabbage looper. I'm trying to eat seminal pumpkins this summer. I don't want you to lay your eggs on, on my plant. So gardening has definitely toughened me up in some ways. Um, I am never sacrificing monarch caterpillars because we all have our preferences. You know, when we think about it, a pest or a weed, it all comes down to our perspective on things. Um, some of the weeds that we have around here are some of my greatest plant allies that we have. Um, and this pest here in front of you, this caterpillar right here that ate this plant um, was transformational in me becoming who I am today. So just prefacing with that before we go into pest management because really it's all very relative. However, I know what's on the next slide. Da da, it's iguana. So everyone's favorite thing to hate in our place. I would love to hear in the chat what everyone hates where you are. I was talking with my friend recently and he was talking about how everybody hates deer where he is. And I think in the next slide, oh yeah, that's the wild pigs. I worked on the big island for a while. We had these giant boars that would just like, like you think iguanas are bad? These giant pigs will come through and root things up knock stuff over they didn't care um this is a little barrier that we built for one of the pumpkins that we had it was knocked over the next day um who are we kidding it's a giant boar but let's go back to iguanas so we'll just touch on iguanas because we are south floridians and we do have iguanas around us so what do we do about iguanas um lots of things we can do um First thing we can do is plant things that iguanas don't necessarily like to eat. So iguanas, all creatures are very smart when it comes to what they do wanna eat and what they don't wanna eat. So I work in one of our city's parks with Heal the Planet uh, in Snyder Park and we have a really strong iguana presence there. Um, we have such iguana diversity that like, we have like black spiny tail iguanas, we have basilisk Jesus lizards, we have like all these crazy creatures. And the garden that I have is pretty much untouched, fairly untouched there, unless I plant something that they're like, oh, did you just plant kale? And they send out the live tweet and all the iguanas come and they eat the kale. Um, but for the most part, we have a very beautiful lush garden that is untouched by the iguanas because it's filled with plants they don't necessarily want to eat. Iguanas don't wanna eat pungent plants like rosemary, oregano, garlic chives, any things that have those essential oils. Iguanas also don't necessarily want to eat things that have cyogenic compounds, which is a lot of our awesome perennial plants like chaya, um, cassava or yucca. Um, another thing to do with iguanas as well too is to plant enough. So for instance, we planted chaya down in the Keys where my dad is and because the iguanas have so little to eat there, the Keys are essentially a rock um, they went at it. They were like, wow, chaya that has cyanide in it. I don't care. I'm hungry. So they just ate it all. Um, so planting enough that you're able to share with iguanas as well, too. The iguanas go up into my moringa tree and they eat the moringa. They've also been eating sweet potatoes as well, too. They eat the sweet potato leaves, but I have enough to share. And if I see them, I'll say, hey, iguanas, get out of here, you know, establish your presence. But for the most part, I'm not like nursing this one little kale plant or whatever it is. And the iguana is not gonna take that out because I have enough to share with them. And if you think about it, being an iguana in the urban environment is probably pretty hard. Uh, another thing we can do for iguanas, say we have something that we really wanna grow. We really wanna grow kale since we're staying with kale on this tub subject. Uh, what do we do? We can create a barrier. It's not the most aesthetically pleasing option, but we have found that iguanas do not like bird netting. Um, I don't know how to feel about bird netting because bird netting is made out of plastic. Also certain other things can get caught in it, namely birds. I've never had a bird get caught in it when I did use it in years past. I did have some curly tail lizards get caught in it, which was pretty heartbreaking to get them out of it. Um, but if that feels like an option that you wanna pursue, you can do that. 
If you have a hard um, exterior, like a wire case, um, they can climb that up. They're crazy dinosaurs. So no, that's not gonna work. The bird netting is flexible. Um, last option, I had a student in one of my previous classes who would kill the iguanas, put them in his crab traps, feed them to the crabs. The crabs would eat the iguanas and he would eat the crabs. So circle of life. Don't wanna to go too much on iguanas because I know my friend in Ontario is like iguanas zoning out, don't care about iguanas. <laughs> But for everybody in Florida, this is a hot button button topic. Okay, glazing past our um, boars. But yeah, most of all, keeping that in mind when it comes to pests. A um, couple other things we can say on pests before we go into plant disease. But it's crazy. We're already almost to seven o'clock. Where does the time go? I think we might have till 7.15 though, Noelia. Is that true? I'm right yeah. in the yeah, 7.15. 17, great. Okay, because I was really starting to be like, whoa, we got a lot to cover. Um, okay, so yeah. Uh, other things we can do for when we have pests move into our system, pest predators. So one of my best friends here in the garden, Jeff and I were talking about this earlier in the week, um, anoles. I should have a picture of an anole on the slide right now. But anoles are our little lizards that we have around. Uh, they're wonderful and hilarious to watch. My partner and I, we watch them in, at nighttime out there on the front porch. We look out the window and they have all these anole dinner theater things that they do where they fight with one another and they mate and they send out their uh, little pouch thing that they have underneath their chin. But what are anoles doing all day when they're not performing dinner theater? They're eating bugs, mosquitoes which are now becoming so rampant with the rains picking up, they're keeping the system in check. So iguanas and anoles, those little lizards that we see around, curly tail lizards as well too, they are eating bugs. They're eating mosquitoes, they're carnivorous. Uh, they're also eating the millipedes as well too. Uh, they're eating uh, not plant matter, but iguanas, are crazy dinosaurs and iguanas are eating plant matter. They're eating bird eggs as well too. Um, iguanas don't eat bugs. So iguanas are in a whole other category than anoles, but anoles do nothing but good, I'm gonna say for our system. They're pooping in the system too, uh, which is good, it's feeding the system. I don't know one bad thing I could say about anoles. If anybody's got one, send it in the chat, I'd love to hear it. Um, all right, let's keep moving. Okay, so other things for pests, beneficial fungi, beneficial nematodes, trap plants as well too. So pitcher plants, uh, nepenthes, which is like our Venus fly trap. Uh, that can be a way to control pests, control mosquitoes. Um, other pest predators as well too would be things like bats, you know? Bats can move through the system and eat so many mosquitoes in one night. I know that uh, possums as well can eat an incredible amount of bugs. They eat ticks as well too. So one of the reasons we have these issues now in the urban environment with certain pests is because we don't have nature's ability to balance itself. Nature knows how to self-regulate itself. Even if I were to leave those caterpillars on the seminal pumpkin, a blue jay or cardinal could come by and pick those off and eat them. So I can come through and I can make that decision to remove them or squish them uh, or feed them to a chicken or whatever it is. But nature also knows what to do in those scenarios as well too. So because we have removed the security from the system, the dragonflies were spraying around our poison ponds as Jeff Lawton was calling them, our gated communities where we have those ponds that have no life in them. Uh, the mosquitoes can just lay their eggs in it. The larvae don't get eaten, they hatch. And then we're like, why do we have so many mosquitoes? And then we don't have the, the pest predators to fly around, the dragonflies, the frogs to eat those things. So diversity balances itself. When we have these systems that are filled with life, we have greater system security and we have to do much less. And then one last option, is a sacrificial plant, which can be hard to do. Um, but like, say you had a plant that was already on its way out, you could allow that to be eaten by 
uh, the pest, because a lot of times, like we said, when a plant is diseased, everyone's like, that's the plant, let's go to that one, because they're weak. Um, so if that's the case, then you can just allow nature to play itself out. It's kind of like a magnet for, it's like when you're at a restaurant, you put out like a little bowl of sugar for all the flies to go to, to stay away from you. Similar sort of situation. All right, plant disease. So what do we do if we encounter plant disease? Wait a second, we haven't even finished with all of our pest stuff yet. So a couple more options for pests in the yard. This is how many options you have before you have to go out and spray anything. You never have to spray anything in your garden ever again. I hope that you leave this conversation with that understanding. Um, but hand picking is a great option to remove things. So as I said, with the um, cabbage looper on the seminal pumpkin, just taking it off, squishing it, getting rid of it. Um, if it's aphids that you have on your plant, like aphids on milkweed, they're best friends forever. You always see them there on the plant. Spray them with some water, rub them off. You got mealy bugs, do the same thing. Just get rid of them, rub them off spray it with some high pressure water. You won't have to deal with it so much anymore. Whoa, giving it away that I love weeds. Let's go back a slide. Um, okay, plant disease. So what do we do about plant disease? Um, we see this happening sometimes like these yellowing of leaves. We start to see our plant sending us signals that something is up and we start to get afraid and we're like, oh my God, what do I do in this scenario right now? So first and foremost, keep calm. A lot of times when we see this happening, we start to freak out and we wanna throw things at it, but uh, try and maintain a level head. And the first thing I would recommend is to remove whatever is diseased from the system. So say you see leaves like this one on the right on your plant, this is the best course of action you can do right off the bat is just to remove those diseased leaves. If you see some black fungus growing on it, you see some yellowing in the leaves, simply removing them from the system can be a huge step in um, preventing disease from spreading. Truly, that's the most important thing that you can do. I'm gonna say most of all when it comes to plant disease is just extracting that diseased matter. So what you can do with that disease plant matter is not put it into our compost pile because that can spread the disease further. Instead, we can solarize that disease matter. So have a little section of your garden that gets a good amount of sunlight, um, put the disease plant matter underneath a tarp or an old shower curtain and the sunlight will solarize, it will kind of burn that disease and that plant matter so that way it's safe and able to be put back into your garden in a couple of months, um, sometimes weeks if it's summertime and it's getting a lot of sun here. Um, but we just wanna make sure we're not cycling that back into the system because that can be prolonging our disease cycle. But as we said earlier, plants are just like us. When we're sick, um, what we need to do is take care of ourselves and the way we can do that is by removing whatever it is that's causing us to get sick, uh, which would be something happening on the leaves, but sometimes it can be something in the soil as well too, as we mentioned. So um, supporting the plant through giving the plant some good bacteria, like when we're sick, it's good to have some probiotics and things like that. So giving it some compost, giving it some mulch, giving it a little bit of love. Um, just like us, we try and use medicine as a last resort. We don't wanna just take antibiotics all the time. We instead, last, last case scenario, want to do that. Um, another thing that's key in preventing disease is sanitation as well. So say you're working with a diseased plant. Um, I really learned this from my grandma who loved orchids and I know that orchid fanatics can be very serious about this. Um, but using a little bit of rubbing alcohol on your tools, cleaning your tools afterwards really helps with um, preventing the spreading of disease as well. But most of all, what we wanna do when we encounter plant disease is just get that stuff out of the system.
Okay, so weeds. Let's talk about weeds. Um, so first and foremost, you should know that I actually love weeds. I know this is controversial, but I hope that you all will check out this website that I'm gonna write in the chat right now, um, eattheweeds.com. But this is an excellent resource for getting to know some of the weeds in your place. And actually, in our summer series, one of our classes is on weeds and some of the weeds in our place. So weeds are different wherever you are, but three of my favorite weeds that I put into this slideshow right here are Biden's Alba, which you can see on the left. It's that little daisy looking flower. Um, the top right photo is our wild Florida wild cucumber. So this is just a vine that you'll find that has these delicious little cucumbers. And then below that is Cersei, which is a wonderful bitter plant that helps to clean the blood and strengthen the immune system. So we won't go into specific weeds tonight, but first and foremost, figuring out whether this weed is actually a weed or instead a plant ally that we didn't even have to do anything to grow. A lot of times as gardeners, we think we got to do it all, but these weeds, they're popping up through our sidewalk cracks and they're trying to provide us with something. So for instance, the plant on the left, Biden's Alba, is a bronchodilator, which means it helps us to open up our lungs, which is really important in the middle of a pandemic where our respiratory system is being affected. The whole plant is edible. It also really helps with mosquito bites too. The flower you can chew up and put on mosquito bites. It's a really, really helpful plant that is often seen as an enemy. So first and foremost, just saying, hey, is this actually a weed or is this instead a plant that I could use? Um, but what do we do if we don't want those weeds around? Like for instance, I said I work in a city park and we, we are not promoting having weeds around there because it's a city park and we wanna keep things tidy. Um, city park wants to keep things tidy. <laughs> But what we can do is just pick and microweed, pull them out. Um, another tool that's really useful, I should have my tool with me right now to show you, uh, but there's something called the comma, which essentially you feel like the Grim Reaper with. <laughs> kind of looks like this, but it's a little hand tool that you can hold in your hand that helps for pulling out weeds. K-A-M-A -A is how you spell that. I always thought it was like C-O-M-M-A when I first learned about commas. I was like, because it looks like a comma, the punctuation mark, but it's a Japanese hand tool called a comma. That's really useful for helping to pull weeds out. And then another option is to suppress weeds through smothering. Um, and this is a two for one as well too, because when we suppress those weeds, um, we're also building soil at the same time. So one of my favorite things to suppress weeds with is mulch. Here in the urban environment, trees are constantly be, being cut down all the time. Um, and this plant matter is being sent off to landfills uh, where it mixes with our inorganic matter and creates a big mess. So what we can do is partner up with our local tree trimmers to have this organic matter dropped at our house. And it's essentially like a forest broken down already that helps to suppress those weeds. Like look right here on the right. This is my first mulch mountain I had dropped. Imagine the grass trying to grow beneath that mulch mountain. It's not gonna happen. So you don't have to keep it as thick as that, but when we're putting mulch in, we definitely wanna keep it thick, especially in the tropics at this time, we wanna go about a foot thick because the mulch is gonna to continue to break down. The more it breaks down, the more weeds can come through. But also keep in mind that even if we lay things down like weed cloth, Weeds, seeds can travel through the air. Spanish needle, which we see right here, can attach to your pants and travel that way. So weeds can come in no matter what. And weeds are often messengers as well too of um, excess nutrients in the system, excess moisture. If you wanna learn more about that as well too, you can look up like, what is oxalis? trying to tell me, <laughs> no, that sounds kind of crazy. Um, what, what is oxalis a symbol of in the soil? Or what, what is this weed um, notifying me of, of a nutrient deficiency? And it can be very um, useful 
in becoming stronger as growers. So yeah, suppressing with mulch, can't beat it. And then once we've laid down our mulch, because we said those weed seeds can blow in from the top, one of the ways that we can continue to suppress those weeds is through ground covers and cover crops. So here in this photo is a picture of sweet potatoes covering the ground. So when we have ground cover, it makes it difficult for other weeds to grow. Nature likes it when you have open ground. They like it when they see that grass lawn. They like it when you have just that freshly mulched area because seeds can just easily grow without competition. So if we have a cover crop or a ground cover in place, it helps to keep those weeds at bay even more. And we get to eat sweet potatoes. Bonus points, if you have a ground cover or cover crop that fixes nitrogen as well in the soil too. So that word we were talking about before, it feeds the soil at the same time. Examples of that in our place would be perennial peanut, sunshine mimosa. For my friends in the north, it could be clovers. Uh, if you want to learn more about cover crops, look up cover crops for your hardiness zone. But that's the next level. So we've got our system in place. We lay down our mulch to suppress those weeds. And then we put in a cover crop to cover the ground and continue to keep them at bay. And then when we have that forest canopy as well too, when less light is coming into the system, less weeds will grow as well too. More light, more growth. We've reached the end of our slideshow. We've reached the end of our food forest series. Um, thank you guys for being here tonight. Let's do a little question and answer now towards the end. Yeah. Um, let me see what time it is. Yeah, three questions here. Okay, great. So before I go into the chat, this is Heal the Planet's contact info. You guys probably maybe follow Heal the Planet online already, but if you want to follow us on our Instagram or Facebook page, you're welcome to do so. That's our website. And then if you'd like to follow my personal page, I try and uh, do educational content on that as well too. And my website is New River Gardens. Here is our plant trees flyer. Noelle, you want to say one last word on the tree planting? Sure, for those who were not um, online before, we're gonna be doing some fruit planting on the 26th of this month, it's a Saturday. You're welcome to join us. As a nonprofit, we do fundraisings, but you don't have to donate. You could just come and participate. The address is right there. If you're local, you can uh, certainly come on, on that day and be part of the planting. Yes, and the planting also coincides with our community garden grand opening. So where we're gonna be planting is the Monarch Food Forest, which I actually just found out great news. It was an open lot that we were growing on a neighboring lot and it actually has been acquired and it is now ours. So the trees will be there for a long time. You can have some security feeling around that because in the urban environment, People are constantly trying to develop land, but this is land that the trees will get to grow big on. So that is great news. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you have fun tonight. I hope you learn. Let's see what's going on in the chat. Eattheweeds.com. You can use hydrogen peroxide to sterilize your tools. Love it, Richie. Um, does it matter if it is mulch mostly from palm trees? Great question. So actually today I was talking to my favorite tree trimmer, Heath from Allison Tree. For my local friends, Allison Tree is a great source for mulch. Um, so palm is not a bad thing. Palm takes longer to break down, um, but palm provides different nutrients than our oak mulch or our hardwood mulch. Aesthetically, people do not love it. So um, what we want to focus on if we do not want to have that palm look is to ask for a clean load of hardwood mulch from our local tree trimmers um, and they'll know what this means. And sometimes there's fear as well too where people will say, uh, what about plant disease? Uh, what about, um, a lot of times we feel safer when we're buying things in a plastic bag like that mulch 
But that mulch in the plastic bag, I have to tell you, is actually not safer in any way. A lot of times it's dyed, like the black and the red, and it can also come from diseased plant matter. I have had tons of mulch dropped on several gardens that I've worked on for several years, and we've never had any issues with it. And keep in mind as well, too, that if there was something in there that was diseased, if you had a healthy and strong system, it wouldn't matter. Like us on the airplane, we're like, it doesn't matter. I'm strong. I had a good night's sleep. I've been eating healthy. I've been taking care of myself. So focusing on creating a healthy, strong system, not being afraid of tapping into those local resources and definitely reaching out to local tree trimmers or just putting your feelers out there. Like I'm sure you'll hear a weed whacker, a leaf blower tomorrow. Um, and you can track some down just on your street. But yeah, clean load of hardwood mulch is what you'd ask for if you didn't want palm. Another thing too, if you get palm dropped off, you could do palm on the bottom layer and then cover with the aesthetically pleasing mulch on top. Megan, another question that Kai was asking is if cats and dogs urine and poop are okay for composting? Good question. So cat and dog all poop takes time to, urine is actually sterile. I was watching The Office the other day and there was a funny thing on it about like peeing on a cut, you know, like urine is sterile. So you can pee in the garden straight up anytime. But when it comes to poop, it takes longer to break down because there are things in poop that could cause harm, both in, it's mainly carnivorous poop. We are, most of us are carnivores, dogs, they're eating meat and things like that, cats as well too. So humanure is a whole separate composting system. We wouldn't put that into our compost pile, um, but I would love to learn. I don't have any pets personally that I've composted their poop, but in the future, maybe I will. And also think about like horse manure and things like that. We're able to use that once it's broken down, but when it first comes out of the creature, it can be filled with pathogens and things like that. But those all break down through uh, the composting process. They just take a little bit longer than like our food scraps and things like that. Um, okay, what trees will you be planting? We will be planting off top of the head. I listed them already here, banana, passion vine, mulberry, fig. And then there's another question about um, what can eat mosquitoes? Kai was asking about- um, What eats mosquitoes if I can't find an anole? Mm -hmm. um, so all sorts of things eat mosquitoes. Kai, if you're located in South Florida, don't worry. Anoles are definitely around eating your mosquitoes already. Um, hopefully you can find it in all though, because they're really funny to watch. Uh, but other things that eat mosquitoes are bats. Like I said, bats few and far between these days, but you could put up a bat box in your house, um, not inside of your house, but in a tree near your house. Um, other things that eat mosquitoes, dragonflies. What else meets mosquitoes? Frogs eat mosquito larva. Um, I feel like I'm on Family Feud where you have to guess the five things that mosquitoes eat. Anybody else got any other ones? Who else eats mosquitoes? He's in LA. <laughs> He's in LA. So I'd be interested. I'm sure you have dragonflies as, as well there too. Um, and maybe hopefully more bats as well where you are. Uh, possums I think as well do too. I bet you guys have different types of lizards there for sure though. I think an oles, but not 100% not positive. But I'd be interested to learn more things that eat mosquitoes as well, too. We should look into that after this call. I will, in fact. <laughs> um, okay, Millie, thank you. Wendy, thank you. Um, Richie, a 25% solution of peroxide also takes care of pests on your plants, like aphids and peroxide. It's just water with an extra hydrogen molecule, so it's completely safe for plants. That's great. Um, so did everyone see that, that Richie said in the chat? about peroxide, taking care of pests. I know sometimes people will use things like Dawn soap and things like that too. But for the most part, I really don't use anything outside of what I've got around me to take care of the garden. But sometimes there's dire circumstances where you could call in things like neem oil and stuff like that. But even then, you don't really have to do stuff like that. But remembering we're gonna extract leaves first and foremost when we see that going on but it's nice to know that peroxide is another good option. Uh, mosquito fish. Yes, Wendy, that's a great one. A 
of course, fish. Uh, stray cats keep killing the lizards. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, stray cats gotta eat too. Okay, so Noelia just posted once again, our planting trees to change the future uh, link. We are about a minute past 7.15. Does anybody else have any more questions? Uh, most of all, I hope that you leave this, this call tonight with a deeper understanding of how the whole system of life can balance itself. A lot of times it's not necessarily up to us. We've created pretty depleted ecosystems where we do have to contribute in some ways. We don't have to, uh, but we can to help the system become stronger. But for the most part, when we bring in more diversity, we will be stronger. So when we plant those host plants that attract those butterflies that attract higher species and keep that cycle going up to apex predators like an owl or something like that, um, we're better able to take care of ourselves. So um, most of all, just keep that in mind that caring for a food forest garden goes beyond our individual actions into the collective ecosystem of life that helps to balance itself. Gambusia fish. <laughs> they must eat mosquitoes, huh, Wendy? Does anybody else have any more questions? I'll stick around for the next minute or two, but I hope you all have a wonderful evening. I hope you'll join us for our summer workshops. I'm pretty sure we're, they're on Heal the Planet's website now. Our next one is gonna be on plant propagation. They're always on the third Thursday of the month. So plant propagation, we're gonna learn how to do cuttings, uh, how to save seeds, um, all sorts of simple techniques for starting a garden for free. Um, I know there's a workshop on weeds as well in there too. And I can't remember what the one in the middle is right now, but they are all on our website and we hope you'll join us. You're welcome to register for them um, through the website. And we hope to see you for our tree planting and garden grand opening soon. Thank you, Richie. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Millie. Millie, if you're still there, we got to figure this out on the ants. I think you have my email. So reach out to me. Let's figure this out on your pavement ants. We're going to do some investigation and we're going to get to the bottom of it. Okay. I think you have my email, right? I'm going to send it in the chat right now. You called me and left a voicemail? I do not recall that. Um, call me again. If you have my, you must have my phone number if you called me. <laughs> okay, great. All right, I'll talk to you soon, Millie. You have a good night. Linda, Cromilda. We'll end the call now. If you wanna review this, it will be on YouTube in the next day or two. And we hope to see you next time. Love to all.